Computers Don't Argue, written in 1965 by Gordon R. Dixon. Narrator's Note, this short story takes the form of a series of letters. Treasure Book Club, please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate this card. Mr. Walter A. Child, balance, $4.98. Dear Customer, enclosed is your latest book selection, Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan, November 16th, 1965. Treasure Book Club, 1823 Mandy Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Sirs, I wrote you recently about the computer punch card you sent, billing me for Kim by Rudyard Kipling. I did not open the package containing it until I had already mailed you my check for the amount on the card. On opening the package, I found the book missing half its pages. I sent it back to you, requesting either another copy or my money back. Instead, you have sent me a copy of Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Will you please straighten this out? I hereby return the copy of Kidnapped. Sincerely yours, Walter R. Child. Second notice, please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate this card. Mr. Walter A. Child, balance $4.98, for Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. If remittance has been made for the above, please disregard this notice. 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan, January 21, 1966. Treasure Book Club, 1823 Mandy Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Sirs, may I direct your attention to my letter of November 16th, 1965? You are still continuing to dun me with computer punch cards for a book I did not order, whereas, actually, it is your company that owes me money. Sincerely yours, Walter A. Child. Treasure Book Club, 1823 Mandy Street, Chicago, Illinois, February 1st, 1966. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodland Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Dear Mr. Child, we have sent you a number of reminders concerning an amount owing to us as a result of book purchases you have made from us. This amount, which is $4.98, is now long overdue. This situation is disappointing to us, particularly since there was no hesitation on our part in extending you credit at the time original arrangements for these purchases were made by you. If we do not receive payment in full by return mail, we will be forced to turn the matter over to a collection agency. Very truly yours, Samuel P. Grimes, Collection Manager. 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan, February 5th, 1966. Dear Mr. Grimes, will you stop sending me punch cards and form letters and make me some kind of a direct answer from a human being? I don't owe you money. You owe me money. Maybe I should turn your company over to a collection agency. Walter A. Child. Federal Collection Outfit. 88 Prince Street, Chicago, Illinois, February 28, 1966. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Dear Mr. Child, your account with the Treasure Book Club of $4.98 plus interest and charges has been turned over to our agency for collection. The amount due is now $6.83. Please send your check for this amount or we shall be forced to take immediate action. Jacob N. Harsh, Vice President. Federal Collection Outfit, 88 Prince Street, Chicago, Illinois, April 8, 1966. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Dear Mr. Child, you have seen fit to ignore our courteous requests to settle your long overdue account with Treasure Book Club, which is now, with accumulated interest and charges, in the amount of $7.51. If payment in full is not forthcoming by April 11, 1966, we will be forced to turn the matter over to our attorneys for immediate court action. Ezekiel B. Harsh, President. 
Maloney, Mahoney, McNamara, and Pruitt, Attorneys, 89 Prince Street, Chicago, Illinois, April 29th, 1966. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Dear Mr. Child, your indebtedness to the Treasure Book Club has been referred to us for legal action to collect. This indebtedness is now in the amount of $10, one cent. If you will send us this amount so that we may receive it before May 5th, 1966, the matter may be satisfied. However, if we do not receive satisfaction in full by that date, we will take steps to collect through the courts. I am sure you will see the advantage of avoiding a judgment against you, which, as a matter of record, would do lasting harm to your credit rating. Very truly yours, Hagthorpe M. Pruitt, Jr., Attorney at Law. 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan, May 4, 1966. Mr. Hagthorpe M. Pruitt, Jr., Maloney, Mahoney, McNamara, and Pruitt, 89 Prince Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Mr. Pruitt, you don't know what a pleasure it is to me in this manner to get a letter from a live human being to whom I can explain the situation. This whole matter is silly. I explained it fully in my letters to the Treasure Book Company, but I might as well have been trying to explain it to the computer that puts out their punch cards for all the good it seemed to do. Briefly, what happened was I ordered a copy of Kim by Rudyard Kipling for $4.98. When I opened the package they sent me, I found the book had only half its pages, but I had previously mailed a check to pay them for the book. I sent the book back to them, asking either for a whole copy or my money back. Instead, they sent me a copy of Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson, which I had not ordered and for which they had been trying to collect from me. Meanwhile, I am still waiting for the money back that they owe me for the copy of Kim that I didn't get. That's the whole story. Maybe you can help me straighten them out. Relievedly yours, Walter A. Child. P.S. I also sent them back their copy of Kidnapped as soon as I got it, but it hasn't seemed to help. They have never even acknowledged getting it back. Maloney, Mahoney, McNamara, and Pruitt. Attorneys. 89 Prince Street, Chicago, Illinois, May 9th, 1966. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Dear Mr. Child, I am in possession of no information indicating that any item purchased from the Treasure Book Club has been returned. I would hardly think that, if the case had been as you stated, the Treasure Book Club would have retained us to collect the amount owing from you. If I do not receive your payment in full within three days, by May 12th, 1966, we will be forced to take legal action. Very truly yours, Hagthorpe M. Pruitt, Jr. Court of Minor Claims, Chicago, Illinois. Mr. Walter A. Child, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Be informed that a judgment was taken and entered against you in this court this day of May 26, 1966, in the amount of $15.66, including court costs. Payment and satisfaction of this judgment may be made to this court or to the adjudged creditor. In the case of payment being made to the creditor, a release should be obtained from the creditor and filed with this court in order to free you of legal obligation in connection with this judgment. Under the recent Reciprocal Claims Act, if you are a citizen of a different state, a duplicate claim may be automatically entered and judged against you in your own state, so that collection may be made there as well as in the state of Illinois. Court of Minor Claims, Chicago, Illinois. Please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate this card. Judgment was passed this day of May 27, 1966, under statute $15.66, against Child, comma, Walter A., of 347 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Pray to enter a duplicate claim for judgment. In Picayune Court, 
Panduk, Michigan, for amount Statue 941. 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan, May 31st, 1966. Samuel P. Grimes, Vice President, Treasure Book Club, 1827 Mandy Street, Chicago, Illinois. Grimes, this business has gone far enough. I've got to come down to Chicago on business of my own tomorrow. I'll see you then, and we'll get this straightened out once and for all about who owes what to whom and how much. Yours, Walter A. Child. From the desk of the clerk, Picayune Court, June 1, 1966. Harry, the attached computer card from Chicago's Minor Claims Court against A. Walter has a 1500 series statute number on it. That puts it over in criminal with you, rather than civil with me. So I herewith submit it for your computer instead of mine. How's business? Joe. Criminal Records, Panduk, Michigan. Please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate this card. Convicted, Child, A. Walter. On May 26, 1966. Address, 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, Michigan. Criminal Statute, 1566. Corrected, 1567. Crime, Kidnap. Date, November 16, 1965. Notes, at large, to be picked up at once. Police Department, Panduk, Michigan, to Police Department, Chicago, Illinois. Convicted Subject A, complete first name unknown, Walter. Sought here in reference to your notification of judgment for kidnap of child named Robert Lewis Stevenson on November 16, 1965. Information here indicates subject fled his residence at 437 Woodlawn Drive, Panduk, and may be again in your area. Possible contact in your area, the Treasure Book Club, 1823 Mandy Street, Chicago, Illinois. Subject not known to be armed, but presumed dangerous. Pick up and hold, advising us of capture. To Police Department, Panduk, Michigan. Reference your request to pick up and hold A, complete first name unknown, Walter, wanted in Panduk on Statute 1567, Crime of Kidnapping. Subject arrested at offices of Treasure Book Club, operating there under alias Walter Anthony Child, and attempting to collect $4.98 from one Samuel P. Grimes, employee of that company. Disposal, holding for your advice. Police Department, Panduk, Michigan, to Police Department, Chicago, Illinois. Reference, A. Walter, alias Walter Anthony Child, subject wanted for crime of kidnap, your area. Reference, your computer punch card notification of judgment, dated May 27, 1966. Copy our criminal records punch card herewith forwarded to your computer section. Criminal Records, Chicago, Illinois. Please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate this card. Subject, correction, omitted record supplied. Applicable statute number 1567. Judgment number 456789. Trial record, apparently misfiled and unavailable. Direction, to appear for sentencing before Judge John Alexander McDivitt. Courtroom A, June 9, 1966. From the desk of Judge Alexander J. McDivitt, June 2, 1966. Dear Tony, I've gotten a judge criminal coming up before me for sentencing Thursday morning, but the trial transcript is apparently misfiled. I need some kind of information, reference A. Walter, judgment number 456789, criminal. For example, what about the victim of the kidnapping? Was victim harmed? Jack McDivitt. June 3rd, 1966, Records Search Unit, RE, Reference, Judgment Number 456789, Was Victim Harmed? Tonio Malagasy, Records Division. June 3rd, 1966, to United States Statistics Office, Attention Information Section, Subject Robert Louis Stevenson, 
is Query Information Concerning, Records Search Unit, Criminal Records Division, Police Department, Chicago, Illinois. June 5, 1966, to Records Search Unit, Criminal Records Division, Police Department, Chicago, Illinois. Subject, your query regarding Robert Louis Stevenson, file number 189623. Action, subject deceased, age at death, 44 years. Further information requested, A, K, Information Section, U.S. Statistics Office. June 6, 1966, to United States Statistics Office, Attention Information Division, Subject RE, File Number 189623. No further information required. Thank you. Records Search Unit, Criminal Records Division, Police Department, Chicago, Illinois. June 7, 1966, to Tonio Malagasy, Records Division. RE reference judgment number 456789 victim is dead record search unit june 7th 1966 to judge alexander j mcdivitt's chambers dear jack reference judgment number 456789 the victim in this kidnap case was apparently slain from the strange lack of background information on the killer and his victim, as well as the victim's age, this smells to me like a gangland killing. This for your information, don't quote me. It seems to me, though, that Stevenson, the victim, has a name that rings a faint bell with me, possibly one of the East Coast mob, since the association comes back to me as something about pirates, possibly New York dockage hijackers and something about buried loot. As I say, above is only speculation for your private guidance. Anytime I can help, best Tony Malagasy, Records Division. Michael R. Reynolds, Attorney at Law, 49 Water Street, Chicago, Illinois, June 8, 1966. Dear Tim, regrets, I can't make the fishing trip. I've been court-appointed here to represent a man about to be sentenced tomorrow on a kidnapping charge. Ordinarily, I might have tried to beg off, and McDivitt, who is doing the sentencing, would probably have turned me loose. But this is the damnedest thing you've ever heard of. The man being sentenced has apparently been not only charged, but a judge guilty as a result of a comedy of errors too long to go into here. He not only isn't guilty... He's got the best case I've ever heard of for damages against one of the larger book clubs headquartered here in Chicago, and that's a case I wouldn't mind taking on. It's inconceivable, but damnably possible, once you stop to think of it in this day and age of machine-made records, that a completely innocent man could be put in this position. There shouldn't be much to it. I've asked to see McDivitt tomorrow before the time for sentencing and it'll just be a matter of explaining to him. Then I can discuss the damage suit with my freed client at his leisure. Fishing next weekend, yours, Mike. Michael R. Reynolds, Attorney at Law, 49 Water Street, Chicago, Illinois, June 10th. Dear Tim, in haste, no fishing this coming weekend either. Sorry, you won't believe it. My innocent as a lamb, and I'm not kidding, client has just been sentenced to death for first-degree murder in connection with the death of his kidnapped victim. Yes, I explained the whole thing to McDivitt, and when he explained his situation to me, I nearly fell out of my chair. It wasn't a matter of my not convincing him. It took less than three minutes to show him that my client should have never been within the walls of the county jail for a second. But... Get this, McDivitt couldn't do a thing about it. The point is, my man had already been judged guilty according to the computerized records. In the absence of a trial record, of course, there never was one, but that's something I'm not free to explain to you now, the judge has to go by what records are available. And in the case of an adjudged prisoner, McDivitt's only legal choice was whether to sentence to life imprisonment or execution. The death of the kidnapped victim, according to the statute, made the death penalty mandatory. 
Under the new laws governing length of time for appeal, which has been shortened because of the new system of computerizing records, to force an elimination of unfair delay and mental anguish to those condemned, I have five days in which to file an appeal and ten to have it acted on. Needless to say, I am not going to monkey with an appeal. I am going directly to the governor for a pardon, after which we will get this farce reversed. McDivitt has already written the governor also, explaining that his sentence was ridiculous, but that he had no choice. Between the two of us, we ought to have a pardon in short order. Then I'll make the fur fly, and we'll get in some fishing. Best Mike Office of the Governor of Illinois, June 17th, 1966. Mr. Michael R. Reynolds, 49 Water Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Mr. Reynolds, in reply to your query about the request for pardon for Walter A. Child, A. Walter, may I inform you that the governor is still on his trip with the Midwest Governor's Committee examining the Berlin Wall. He should be back next Friday. I will bring your request and letters to his attention the minute he returns. Very truly yours, Clara B. Jilks, Secretary to the Governor. June 27, 1966. Michael R. Reynolds, 49 Water Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Mike, where is that pardon? My execution date is only five days from now. Walt. June 29, 1966. Walter A. Child, A. Walter, Cell Block E, Illinois State Penitentiary, Jolette, Illinois. Dear Walt, the governor returned but was called away immediately to the White House in Washington to give his views on interstate sewage. I am camping on his doorstep and will be on him the moment he arrives here. Meanwhile, I agree with you about the seriousness of the situation. The warden at the prison there, Mr. Alan Magruder, will bring this letter to you and have a private talk with you. I urge you to listen to what he has to say, and I enclose letters from your family also urging you to listen to Warden Magruder. Yours, Mike. June 30th, 1966. Michael R. Reynolds, 49 Water Street, Chicago, Illinois. Dear Mike, this letter being smuggled out by Warden Magruder. As I was talking to Warden Magruder in my cell here, news was brought to him that the governor has at last returned for a while to Illinois and will be in his office early tomorrow morning, Friday, so you will have time to get the pardon signed by him and delivered to the prison in time to stop my execution on Saturday. Accordingly, I have turned down the warden's kind offer of a chance to escape since he told me he could by no means guarantee to have all the guards out of my way when I tried it, and there was a chance of my being killed escaping. But now everything will straighten itself out. Actually, an experience as fantastic as this had to break down sometime under its own weight. Best, Walt. For the sovereign state of Illinois, I, Hubert Daniel Willikins, Governor of the State of Illinois, and invested with the authority and powers appertaining thereto, including the power to pardon those in my judgment wrongly convicted or otherwise deserving of executive mercy, do this day of July 1st, 1966, do announce and proclaim that Walter A. Child, A. Walter, now in custody and a consequence of erroneous conviction upon a crime of which he is entirely innocent, is fully and freely pardoned of said crime. And I do direct the necessary authorities having custody of the said Walter A. Child, A. Walter, in whatever place or places he may be held, to immediately free, release, and allow unhindered departure to him. Interdepartmental Routing Service Please do not fold, mutilate, or spindle this card. Failure to route document properly. 2. Governor Hubert Daniel Wilkins. Regarding pardon issued to Walter A. Child, July 1st, 1966. Dear state employee, you have failed to attach your routing number. Please resubmit document with this card and form 876 explaining your authority for placing a top rush category on this document. Form 876 must be signed by your departmental superior. Resubmit on 
earliest possible date routing service office is open. In this case, Tuesday, July 5th, 1966. Warning. Failure to submit Form 876 with the signature of your superior may make you liable to prosecution for misusing a service of the state government. A warrant may be issued for your arrest. There are no exceptions. You have been warned. Thank you for listening.